Once again, I'm Jeff Solomon with Kay Bender Rembaum. And uh, the first person I want to introduce today will be, let's see, let's spin the wheel. Who are we going to stop on? We're going to stop first on Mr. Bill Kilgallen from, hey, how about, am I pronouncing it Haferco? Am I pronouncing yes. it properly? Yes, it's Haferco. So tell everybody a little bit about yourselves and how they can contact you. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you are going to sit back and enjoy our class and ask a lot of questions. I'm Bill Kilgallen with Hafer uh, LLC. We're a CPA firm. Uh, we do accounting, tax, and consulting type work. Uh, we do over probably 750 associations, so we're, we're pretty familiar with uh, association, tax, and accounting out there. Um, and so, like I said, sit back, enjoy the class, and be sure to ask us a lot of questions. Thank you, Bill. And now in my order of the circle here, we are going to go to Mr. Brian Street from the Castle Group. Brian, tell everybody a little bit about yourselves and how they can reach you. Great. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Brian Street with Castle Group. I'm our senior or actually executive vice president of operations. I uh, actually have an engineering background as well. Been with Castle for about uh, 12 years now. Um, and we basically manage large, uh, large scale associations, both from the HOA side and the condo side. So today we're going to be focusing more on the, the condominium aspect, obviously, with the, uh, the SB4D. Uh, and we manage a little over 80 large uh, uh, condo tower buildings that this is really going to impact. So, uh, and again, we're with Castle Group, so you can always just go to castlegroup.com and, and that's uh, the best way to, to get to us. Brian, what's your engineering background? I was a civil, so um, I did basically <laughs> underground site plan design, underground water, sewer, um, you know, things of that nature. Are you ready to do your uh, structural integrity reserve studies or milestone <laughs> reports? <laughs> Absolutely. I can always, I can always read them. I will, oh. get, I will, I can read them and act as a, uh, a definite kind of work with Rudy on on how they're presented and, and kind of make some layman's terms out of some of the engineering. Uh, so you uh, so you're like a liaison then from the board to the engineer. That background absolutely. is really coming. That is in. correct. It's nice that you have that on board. Yeah. And now we're going to move over to Jamie Gelfand from Truist. Jamie, known you a long time, but not everybody in the audience does. So please tell everybody a little bit about yourself and how to reach you. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining the class today. My name is Jamie Gelfand. I work at Truist. Truist is the end result of the merger between BB&T and SunTrust. I work in the Association Services Division, and we provide loans for any projects under, authorized under the Declaration of the Association or Emergency Lines of Credit. I'll be putting my information in the chat. My phone number is 561-251-1980. Thank you. Jamie, got Thank a question you. for you. Uh, maybe you can take it back to your team at Truist, but I'd like to find some uh, legislation, draft some legislation up that allows an association to borrow funds, even if required in the governing documents, as long as it's for required maintenance, replacement, or repair notwithstanding any vote requirements that are in the governing documents. What do you think about that? Well, we do uh, today do loans up to 15 years with up to a 24 month interest only period for any authorized work under the declaration of the association. Yeah, the problem I'm running into sometimes is on these big repairs and sometimes they're gonna be called for, especially as we start digging into the milestone and Sears, that require significant funds. And if the they don't have it on hand and they'd like to not have to do a direct special assessment at the membership level, which is always a possibility, why not have legislation that provides that the, that the board can borrow funds even if the vote is otherwise required? Let the vote of the membership for loans always be required for capital improvement, something new. But if it's for required maintenance, that comes out of these milestones and Sears reports, why not let the board have the authority to borrow the necessary funds from the bank and instead of having to do a cash call with the owners via special assessment, you know, structure it out over a 10 year loan or 15, whatever you guys are doing. I'm gonna talk about that later, but um, I've been doing a lot of thinking about that and I might start doing some drafting. And we would, uh, we would definitely be supportive of that. Cool. Yeah, that'd be a good thing, I think. Sorry to interrupt, Jeff. I'm just trying to add some flavor as we go. No, no, no need to apologize at whatsoever. And uh, lastly, I'm going to move over now to Rudy Martin from M2E Consulting Engineers. Rudy, please tell us what you do, who you are, and how to reach you. Thank you. 
So my name is Rudy Martin. I'm the Director of Strategic Business Development at M2E. We're consulting engineers. In regards to the condos associations, we can help with everything regarding your building envelope. So obviously the milestones and the um, SIRS we can handle, um, any structural 558, uh, anything in regards to that. Um, I will be sending out an email. My contact information will go out after this uh, webinar with my contact information. If we can't answer your questions today, we'll try to uh, schedule something so we can answer them in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Rudy. Nice to have you on board with us today uh, once again. And now I want to introduce from Kay Bender Rambam, a, a person who I might add that when I was on the management side of things and I had to sit on a lot of these CAM uh, courses, this stuff that could be considered by some boring, not me, of course, not me, of course, never would use the word boring, but this gentleman can take some of the most mundane material and add so much flavor to use the word flavor earlier. And I'm privileged to be able to work with him now. Uh, he really uh, keeps your attention. Jeff. Rembaum from our K Bender Rembaum Palm Beach Gardens office. Jeff is a he's one of the firm members and he's a board certified specialist in condominium and plan development law. There aren't that many of those in the state and we have one of them here today. And he was once again in 2022 named legal elite by Florida Trend Magazine by the Florida Trend Organization and also Florida Super Lawyers for the 11th straight year. He's also Florida Supreme Court certified circuit civil mediator. And he also, also created and authors Rembaum's Association Roundup, the community association news you can use. And I've used it quite a bit. So without further ado, I want to turn it over now to uh, Jeffrey Rembaum from K. Bender Rembaum. Thank Jeff, you. we're lucky to have you as well. And I don't know that Thank I can you. live up to all of that, but I will try. <laughs> I apologize to my co-panelists because for the next 20 or 30 minutes, it might be a little boring for the co-panelists. So as I'm speaking and going through the webinar materials this morning, um, if you at home while you're or at work and you have questions, go ahead and write them into the chat because as soon as I'm done talking about Senate Bill 4D and going through it with a somewhat of a fine tooth comb, um, then we're gonna start coming through the questions. And having just spoken for the last 30 minutes or so, I think we really want to involve Bill and Jamie and Brian and Rudy um, and uh, hear what they have to say as this legislation impacts their various fields of accounting, banking, engineering, management, and of course, then there's the legal side. So we have a preface. What are we talking about today is Senate Bill 4D, or as I refer to it as the uh, Engineering Act that will ensure Rudy uh, has lots of work to do before he can reach retirement age. And the work will probably keep on coming even after. They want to talk about some terms today, milestone inspection, structural integrity reserve study, and substantial structural deterioration. Those are important terms. We're going to talk about when compliance is required for both the milestone and the Sears report, structural integrity reserve study. I'll probably say the long form of it a few more times, but eventually we're just going to refer to it as Sears for the remaining part of today's webinar. Remember that the Sears must be completed for the very first time, no later than December 31st, 2024. We'll get into more details on the compliance date, such as the milestone, which is 30 years after the date of your certificate of occupancy, or uh, if you're within three miles of the coast, then 25 mile, then 25 years rather of the date of your certificate of occupancy. And if you're already at that 30 year mark, well, we have that date we already talked about a moment ago, December 31st, 2024. So that's also going to be the compliant date uh, for the milestone if your uh, building is already at the 30 year mark. We're going to talk about the phase one and phase two. Uh, reports that are generated with the milestone inspection. We're going to talk about the post milestone inspection requirements. The inspection report that must be completed by the Florida licensed architect or engineer has to be delivered to local government, has to be given to the association. Then there's the association's duty after receiving the report and what it must do with the report. Websites, 
hand, uh, providing it to membership, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to talk about who pays for these reports, what happens if you don't obtain them, and what is the manager's duty. We're going to talk about the impact of these reports on the official records on the association's websites and the jurisdiction of the Division of Condominiums insofar as a failure to complete these reports. Jamie just posted her phone number because it just popped up on my screen. Uh, we have new reporting requirements for all condominium and cooperative associations and new seller obligations as well. So on the one hand, all condominium cooperatives are going to have a requirement regarding their building to give information to the division of condominium. And on a different note, we have new seller obligations in regard to these reports and what you must do. We have applicability issues dealing with three stories or higher. We've got the new reserve re requirements, which again, December 31st, 2024 is your target date. And we're going to talk about glitches in just a moment before we get into the substance so that when we get into the substance of everything and we continue to talk about it, it'll make more sense. Now, <laughs> as a starting point, requirements of the new law for both milestone inspections and reserves do not apply to a condominium or cooperative building, which is less than three stories. Then we get into the question of what is a story? So not talking about a parable or a verse in the Bible, we're talking about a story as in floors of the building. And that is defined in the Florida Building Code as the space between a floor and the floor or roof above. So therefore garages and other occupied levels count as stories if we're gonna apply that definition. As to buildings, three stories or more, the milestone inspection requirements apply to buildings that are at least 30 years old or 25 years old if within three miles of the coastline. Everybody is asking, what is a coastline? For you legal eagles that are tuned in today, write this number down. Go to statute uh, 376.031, subsection 4. That's chapter 376. The statute is 376.031 sub 4. Coastline means, and I expect everyone, if there was a test afterward, to be able to answer this question. So multiple choice, remember the answer is C. Coastline means the line of mean low water along the portion of the coast that is in direct contact with the open sea and the line marking the seaward limit of the inland waters as determined by the Convention on Territorial Seas and contiguous zone. Everybody get that? Technical definition, but you asked for it. There it is. Milestone inspections do not apply to a single family, two family, or three family building that is one to three units with three or fewer habitable stories above. You can begin to see some of the glitches taking form. The new non waivable requirements that are set out in little g of the legislation apply to condominium and cooperative buildings three stories or higher, regardless of age. So milestone, yes, age is important. But when it comes to the new reserve requirements we'll be discussing, uh, age of the building is not a factor. All right, let's see. Okay, let's talk about, let's go then into some of the glitches that I'd like you to focus on while I'm describing the legislation itself. Talk about a big one that's come up. The Structural Integrity Reserve Study is due by December 31st, 2024. In other words, you have until that date to complete it. So the question then becomes, what year is it supposed to be in the association's budget? Let's assume in 2024, the association does its uh, budget, right? And gets ready for the 2025 year in October, maybe even September, because management companies like to get out of that, get it done early, last month, maybe in the third quarter, first month in the fourth quarter, somewhere in there. And then, so now you've adopted your budget. Now, the legislation says for the Structural Integrity Reserve Study, you have to have it completed by December 31st, 2024. Where in the legislation does it say it needs to be in effect for the budget year of 2025? It doesn't. You have to make an assumption that if it has to be completed by December 31st, 2024, and you want to be in the safe zone, you're going to amend your budget to include those reserve requirements. You're going to be uh, playing with fire if you say, wait a minute, the legislation said I don't have to have it done till December 31st, 2024. I did that. Now I'm not going to take it into account until I do my next budget, 
which would be when? In September, October of 2025, preparing for 2026. That's a glitch in the bill. It needs to be addressed. We have other glitches when applying to condominium and cooperative buildings three stories or higher, but not to single family, two family, and three family dwellings with three or fewer habitable stories. Well, which one is it? Um, can a condominium association, cooperative association, pool the new reserve categories that we'll talk about in just a little bit that include things such as windows, uh, structural walls, and foundation? Can the association create a pool? Good question. We'd like to get some guidance in that legislation. Um, how do windows get applied when you need the reserves created. The legislation says you must reserve for windows, but windows in this association are an owner responsibility pursuant to the Declaration of Condominium. Do we still have to reserve for windows? And if so, by what formula, by what method? Good questions. It needs a glitch bill to get that cleared up. What is a building story? I'd like to see a little more clarity there. How long do we have to post the milestone report? When we talk about it, the legislation says you got to post it. Okay, for how long? What is the definition of a term fully funded? There are discrepancies between the way we define it in Florida and the way it is defined nationally. We need to get clarity on that. What about Kaufman language and its applicability for you condominium buffs out there? You know that Kaufman language essentially takes the law and it's as if your declaration of condominium was recorded with the anticipation that all future legislative changes would apply to your association and interpretation of declaration of condominium. If you don't have Kaufman language, does this new legislation still apply? I would think that the overwhelming majority of association lawyers believe that it does, but it would be nice to have some clarity there. Senate Bill 4D, you can tell that the legislature really knew what they were doing when they drafted this legislation for it to get through so many committees. And for them to use the term common area, which does not exist within the Florida body of condominium law in the first place. We have common elements in condominium law. All of the owners own an indivisible interest in the common elements. Yet Senate Bill 4D uses the term common area and you just simply have to make the uh, leap, if you will, the intrinsic leap in your mind. They're really talking about common elements. Um, what if? You've already performed your milestone inspection. And then, as you'll hear in the legislation in a few minutes, if you get a notice from local government, you have to also do the inspection within 180 days of getting the notice from local government. Well, what if you did the report 185 days ago? Do you have to get a new report? Excellent question. There are so many glitches in this bill that just need clarification. And then there are many, many substantive changes as well. I don't know if there are any groups working on substantive changes. I have heard of a few committees uh, working on legislative glitches for the bill, including uh, a subcommittee of the Florida Bar Real Estate Section, as well as CAI, Community Association Institute. I'm not sure what else may be happening in that regard. Okay, now Jeff uh, Solomon from my office for all the attendees today, I wrote a detailed article published it on the Roundup. If anybody is listening and you do not receive the Roundup, by virtue of your attendance today, we will add you to the uh, distribution list if ever you want off the list because you've had enough of association living, you're moving out of your condominium, <laughs> single family home, never to live in a condo again, then you can unsubscribe at the bottom of the Roundup. And even I can't re-add you to the list. Only you can re-add you once you unsubscribe. But essentially every couple of weeks or every month or so, uh, I address new legislation, new court cases affecting homeowner condominium cooperative living. It's really geared in plain English for managers, for developers, for owners, for and most especially for you board members that are out there. Will so do. the mile, thank you, Jeff. The milestone inspection. So we're going to send everybody the article that I wrote on the bill, and then if you still have questions, um, I think that between today's lecture and reviewing that article that Jeff sends around should help. And most especially if you have insomnia, certainly take time to read that Roundup article at right around bedtime and it should help you go to sleep as well because the subject matter is so very interesting. Actually, it is interesting and it does take a, uh, you might want to have a cup of coffee actually before you read it. 
because there's a lot of information in there. And now we're going to get into the meat of that information. Terms. First terms you need to know. Milestone inspection. It's a structural inspection, including load-bearing walls and primary structural members and systems, which must be performed by a Florida licensed engineer or architect. And they must attest, A-T-T-E-S-T, -T -E attest. That means signed and sealed life, safety, and adequacy of the structural components of the building, determine the general structural condition of the building as it affects safety, including a determination of any necessary maintenance, repair, replacement of any structural component of the building. That's why you heard me talking about the right of the board to borrow funds from a, a lending institution, even if the documents would otherwise require the vote of that membership. We need to help our associations in the state of Florida um, have the resources to get the funding to effectuate these, what could turn out to be very expensive repairs. Substantial structural deterioration means substantial structural distress that negatively affects a building's general structural condition and integrity. So those are the uh, terms that you really need to be familiar with from the outset. Then we have a couple of other items. When must the milestone inspection be completed? In general, we've already discussed this a little bit already, by December 31st of the year in which the building reaches 30 years of age, and then every 10 years after, as calculated from the initial certificate of occupancy. All right. Fine, another glitch. We have certificates of occupancy. We also have temporary certificates of occupancy. Under some conditions, owners, can, the developer can start to close on the building. So when is the target date? The actual certificate of occupancy or the temporary certificate of occupancy? We should get some clarity of that. If the building is within three miles of the coastline, then you must have your milestone inspection completed by December 31st of the year in which the building is 25 years from the date of the initial certificate of occupancy and every 10 years thereafter. If your certificate of occupancy was issued on or before December 31st, 1992, which essentially means your building is already at the 30 year mark or will be at the 30 year mark by December 31st, 2022, then you must have your milestone inspection completed by December 31st, 2024. Well, that's not very far away when you think about it. So you need to start doing some planning now. There's only so many engineers and architects in the state. You really want to get on their schedule. And Rudy, I hope you will address that later uh, in just a little bit. Milestone inspection itself has two phases. Phase one, phase two. But when you think about what the engineer or architect has to attest to, sign and seal is really what attest means. Uh, yet they're putting their license on the line. They're putting their malpractice carriers on the line in ways in which they've never been asked to do before. So I think phase one really more often than not will probably lead to a phase two. So the phase one is taking a visual look at the major structural components, qualitative assessment of structural components of the building. If there's no signs of distress, well, you're done. But if there are, you go to phase two. And phase two is wide open. It can include destructive and non-destructive testing to confirm if the building is structurally sound and safe for its intended use and to recommend, an, recommend a program for fully assessing the problem and repairs to the damaged portions of the building. Then we have post, once you have that report, now we have requirements as well dealing with that report. Upon completion of the phase one or phase two milestone inspection, the architect or engineer who performed it has to submit that sealed copy to both the association and to the building official of the local government in the municipality, in the jurisdiction for where that condominium is located. The inspection reports must at a minimum meet all of the following criteria, bear the seal and signature, of the engineer or architect, licensed engineer or architect who performed the inspection. Indicate the manner and type of inspection forming the basis for the inspection report. Identify the substantial structural deterioration. State whether it is unsafe or dangerous. Recommend remedial preventative measures. Identify and describe items needing further inspection. 
then the association has duties as well. After it receives that report, it then has to provide it by United States mail, personal delivery or electronic transmission to owners who previously consented to receiving their notice by elect, uh, electronic notices. It needs to provide the report and it must publish that report on the association's website if you're required to have the website in the first place and you have to post it in a conspicuous place on the condominium property. Here's an interesting question. How long does the association have to post it in a conspicuous place? Let's say the conspicuous place is the bulletin board. We posted the report. We don't need another report for 10 years. Does that mean we have to post the report for 10 years on the bulletin board and on the website? Good questions, no guidance in the legislation whatsoever to give us any sense of answers. Who pays for the report? You'll be happy or unhappy as the case may be to know it's not the state. It's all of you who are listening. It's the owners within the associations that are paying for this report. If you fail to obtain the report, and if you fail to obtain the structural integrity reserve study, since we're on the subject of breach of fiduciary duty, if you fail to do either one of those two items, it is considered in this legislation a breach of fiduciary duty. The manager's duty is to comply as directed by the board. So it's really interesting language in the legislation affecting managers. Don't think you're going to blame your manager for the board's failure to get this report. Here's why, listen to the language in the legislation. If a community association manager or community association management firm has a contract with the community association that has a building on the association's property subject to the milestone inspection, the community association manager or the community association management firm must comply with the requirements of performing the inspection, here's the magic language, as directed by the board. You probably, if things are not going well and your manager is not following up in getting these reports, you certainly want to create a written record of directing the manager so the board wants to create a written record to the manager to begin working towards compliance of these reports. Remember that the milestone inspection does not apply to a single family, two family, three family dwelling with three or fewer habitable stories above the ground. All right. The official record. So these reports, when they come out, both milestone and the Sears report, Structural Integrity Reserve Study, have to be kept for at least 15 years. We've already talked about the need to post it on the website if you uh, have the need to have a website, if you are legally required to have one. The official records of the association now include both the results of the milestone report and the Sears. Renters have new rights. Renters have the right to inspect the milestone inspection report and the Sears report. Again, we talked about they have to be maintained for 15 years. After turnover has occurred, the Division of Condominium has some jurisdiction to investigate complaints related only to financial issues and elections, maintenance of and unit, maintenance of and unit owner access to the official records, and procedural completion of the structural integrity reserve study. So why it's a breach of fiduciary duty for the board not to have completed either the milestone or the Sears, the division of condominium has jurisdiction regarding the procedural completion of the structural integrity reserve study. We expect to see some new administrative rules. Uh, can't tell you when, but I would imagine in the next six to eight months or so, we'll start to see those. Now, new requirements. Everybody take out your pen and paper. You want your managers to do this. This is a deadline due before January 1st, 2023. Well, that's right around the corner. The division of condominium needs to be informed by every association, regardless of the number of stories. This is everybody, there are no exceptions. The number of buildings on the condominium property that are three stories or higher in height, the total number of units in all of the buildings, the addresses of the buildings and the counties in which the buildings are located. Now, if you're selling your unit, you're an owner and you're selling, what is your duty to provide to the buyer? As part of the sales process, the seller of a condominium or cooperative unit and developers must provide to potential purchasers the inspector prepared summary of the milestone inspection report 
and a copy of the most recent SEERS, the Structural Integrity Reserve Study. <laughs> so sellers have new requirements as well. Woo, that was a mouthful. We're going to shift gears to the Structural Integrity Reserve Study requirements. And while he is sipping his cup of joe, uh, we used the word chat earlier. The chat is closed for y'all. What we meant is use the Q&A to type in your questions. We see many of you are, and we'll be getting to them shortly. And the questions can be for anybody on the panel, not just for, for Jeff Rambaum. Back to you, sir. Absolutely, please. Lots of questions for the banker, the engineer, the accountant, the management group representative, the candlestick maker, and the baker. <coughs> Reserve items. We already talked about the new term, Sears. Structural Integrity Reserve Study. Remember that the it means the SEERS is required for future major repairs and replacement of common areas based on a visual inspection of the common areas applicable to all condominium and cooperative buildings, three stories or higher, must be completed by December 31st, 2024. I would suggest to you that that glitch I referenced earlier that you still account for somehow, some way to be on this in the safe zone. The results of for the new reserves need to be accounted for in your 2025 budget. So if you've already adopted your budget in September, and then on December 31st, 2024, you get the results of your Sears, then you're probably going to want to sometime in January begin discussing amending the budget to account for those new reserve items. Let's talk about the categories that needs to be included in the Sears report. The roof, load-bearing walls and other primary structural members, the floor, the foundation, fireproofing and fire protection systems, plumbing, electrical systems, waterproofing and exterior painting, windows, and the catch-all, any other item that has a deferred maintenance expense or replacement cost that exceeds $10,000 and the failure to replace or maintain such item negatively, negatively affects those items I have just read off to you. The visual inspection associated with the Sears report can be performed by any person qualified, but however, right, I after E except after C, in this body of law, there is an exception to practically everything. So on the one hand, the Sears report could be completed by anyone qualified, and it would sound like Brian, off the, off the face of it, is qualified. But the visual inspection portion of the Sears report of the Structural Integrity Reserve Study must be performed by an engineer licensed under Chapter 471 or architect licensed app, app under rather Chapter 481. So what's the point of having any qualified person to do your Sears when in fact that really at the end of the day needs to be the licensed Florida engineer or architect? How much to reserve? Well, that's really gonna be based on the information set out in the Sears report, fully funded. Let's talk about what that means for the purposes, at least in Florida, right here, right now. Don't care what they're doing in the rest of the, of the nation and how it might be de defined elsewhere, fully funded. Simplest way to think about it. We have a component. Its cost of replacement is $100,000. It has a 10-year life. We are in year six. How much money should we have in the reserves? We should have $60,000 set in the reserves. We have $40,000 to go, $10,000 a year, because at the end of the 10th year, we need to replace the component. It's very simple math. $100,000 component, 10-year life, equals save $10,000 per year. If it's not in the Structural Integrity Reserve Study, then the amount to be reserved is the old formula, if you will, that we just discussed a moment ago. If the uh, repair replacement maintenance exceeds $10,000, then it should be accounted for in the reserve study in addition to all of those items I read before. And roof, load-bearing walls, floor foundation, fireproofing, plumbing, electrical systems, waterproofing windows, and any other item greater than $10,000, um, is going that, that has that one time repair exp uh, uh, replacement expense associated with it. All of that needs to be in the report, but those items we refer to in the business, if you will, as the items in little g. So if your attorney is talking about the little g reserve items, that's because it's in the little g section of the applicable legislation. 
That's why it gets that nomenclature. Can I interject one quick comment slash question, please? I'm almost done, but you certainly may. Thanks. There's a, there's, a few, <laughs> there's a few people in here asking very similar questions about, is this for condo and co-op only? But yes. what if there's an HOA and they have a clubhouse that's three stories or higher? No. Um, right now, we are only discussing condominium and cooperative associations. These requirements apply to them, not to the homeowner association, Got though I could easily see clarification or not really clarification, but expansion, if you will, into the homeowner association world pending certain circumstances, though in the 25 years or so I've been at this, I don't think I've ever seen any, I've never seen anything more than a two-story clubhouse at most, and primarily they're one-story gorgeous buildings. So um, be interesting to see if that uh, gets Got it. for in the Thank you. Yeah, we just killed several questions, uh, killed several birds with one stone. So but back remember, to we're supposed to be asking questions, not for the attorneys, but for the accountant, the engineers, the management company, and bankers. So you can take into account adjustments. I mean, let's go back to our $100,000 item. We had $100,000 for the replacement. We are in year five. We've already saved 50,000. We did a major repair and it extended the life another 10 years. Now you can take that into account for the remainder useful life of that component. You'll no longer be reserving at the $10,000 a year. It will be less. Developers can no longer waive reserves. Developers used to, for a condominium, be able to waive the reserves for the first two years. So the developer, essentially, when you buy a condominium, and please, condominium owners, don't hate me for explaining it this way, but essentially, y'all bought a cube of air bounded by paint on the sides and flooring from the unfinished surface up and some type of ceiling, maybe uh, the lowest level, the highest level of the of the roof structure, if you will, at its lowest point. So that would be just before the popcorn in the ceiling. Um, so really, you bought a cube of air bounded by some paint and stucco, perhaps at best. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that everything else is common element and it needs to be properly maintained. Sadly, because of what happened in Surfside with Champlain, this legislation is a direct result of that incident. Insurers were already pulling out of the state of Florida. And then when Champlain happened, the few that were left, they started pulling out. This is the legislature's, I think, uh, effort, if you will, at letting the insurers know by providing insurance in Florida, you're not gonna get totally hosed, at least due to a building's age. And if you look at what recently happened on the West Coast of Florida, and I know I speak for all of us that our hearts go out to everybody over there, the buildings that were more recently built according to the Miami-Dade hurricane standards fared so much better than the buildings that did not have those requirements. So I think overall, we're really starting to um, shore up all of our buildings in the state of Florida. And we need to do that to convince the insurance market, Florida is an okay place to come back to, to write insurance. Importantly, when it comes to the structural integrity reserve study, owners, not only can the developer not waive out, but you all cannot waive anymore to reduce or waive reserves. As it stands today, the board is obligated to pass the reserves fully funded. Then if the board wants to, it can provide an opportunity to the membership to waive or reduce. The board has never been obligated to do that. And by the way, for those listening, it happens in that order. You don't um, adopt a budget with the reserves already reduced. You actually adopt the budget with the reserves fully funded. Then you roll out of the board budget meeting into a membership meeting to waive or reduce if that is the, at the pleasure of the board. Many of our associations provide two budgets. Here's the one we have to adopt pursuant to Florida law. And here's how it'll look if you members choose to vote to waive or reduce at the level being provided to the board. But I think of all the changes, that's the biggest change of all. Can we pull the items? It's not really clear yet. 
Um, and you can argue both sides as to why you can pool and not pool. And essentially, pooling allows an association to still save for the components, but it takes into account that not all the components are going to fail at the same time so that you have the requisite funds you need at all relevant times. But you actually save money because you don't have to um, save quite as much when you're doing the pooling method. I can leave that more to Bill to talk about later. It would be nice to get clarity in the legislation that, yes, it's OK to pool those items in little g. Uh, but remember, at the moment, there is no waiving and no reducing whatsoever. And we talked about the developer's duty. And by the way, the developer also has to provide the first structural integrity reserve study at turnover. All right. Whew. My notes say to go back to glitches, but I think we've covered them exhaustedly. Let's go ahead and take a look at the questions and start involving the other panelists. Absolutely. And I'm speaking that to our panelists. If you see a question that I haven't gotten to yet or simply overlooked, uh, you can just raise your hand, use the raise hand icon, and I will uh, call upon our own panelists to answer some of the questions that uh, they feel are pertinent to this topic of discussion. And our first question can probably go to Bill. I believe the way SB4D is currently written, it'll require Sears components reserves to be on a straight line basis. Is that correct? And then he's got a follow up. Does that sound correct? Yes. Yeah, so it's my understanding right now that it's silent the way the law was written, but most people are assuming that you can use pooled or straight line method to fund paragraph G. I do reserve. want to then jump in. If you, if you start in year one, once you have your structural integrity reserve study and you treat them as straight line, don't think you're going to be able to pool thereafter. What Bill is referring to really is starting at inception. And that's why we need the clarification in the legislation. Right. And the other, the other thing that's an important point as well, too, is that paragraph G reserves can't be combined with your existing reserves. They've got to be separated. And the use of those uh, pooled reserves or straight line reserves from paragraph G uh, are set aside because they need to be monitored as the funds are expended. All right. Uh, Jamie, do you have, where did, it, oop, where did it go? Jamie, do you have reserves to qualify for the loans you mentioned? Is that the one, Jim? It, I was reading it and it disappeared. Ah, I have it here. Uh, Jamie, do you have, do you have to have reserves to qualify for the loans you mentioned at 15 years? 24 months interest, thanks. Do you have to have the reserves? So, no, we don't have, we don't use reserves as a qualifying factor in order to approve a loan. We do um, risk grade the loan based on the number of units in the building, the value of the units, your delinquency ratios, and are you asking for a loan related to the life expectancy of the project. So if they have no reserves because they've waived every single year, they can still come to you for a consideration of a loan. That's not gonna knock them out out of the box. Correct. That's good to know. Jamie, real quick, just on a, some of our boards uh, to kind of feed off of that a little bit have asked, you know, is there a best practice, not just coming for the loan because sometimes on a construction project, you know, you have some soft cost, hard cost as you work your way through, you have an estimate. Is it better to start with like a line of credit of some kind, say it's a million dollar project, but it ends up being 1 million 50. So you don't want to take out the loan for, you know, somewhere around there. So you kind of do a line of credit up until the very end and then it kind of converts back to a loan. So at Truist, we don't do, we don't recommend a line of credit. We do an upfront interest only period into a term loan. So it's a little bit of a different nomenclature. So we'll do up to a 15 year loan with up to 24 months interest only. The interest rate is locked at the date of closing, whereas a line of credit for us is a variable interest rate. So term loans are at a fixed rate, and today they are at a less uh, lower rate than prime at six and a quarter today, which is where your lines of credit would be. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, I'm going to address one real quick. Somebody has asked, uh, Jack asked, when, uh, what does our condo association need to do in 2023 and how much should we budget? Well, you're going to really want to 
you have to send that information to the division of condominium uh, by December 31st, 2023. So if that costs more than $100 to get that information to the division, uh, that is probably overstating it. I would suspect you, you can even go online and I believe the division now has a form. You can fill it out directly online. Shouldn't take more than five minutes or so to answer those questions. So Correct. that's it for 2023. But you do want to start considering the monies you're going to need in uh, 2024 because you're going to have to bring the architect or engineer on board to do that uh, Sears report by December 31st, 2024. Okay. Okay, we have a question here. Can the required structural engineering studies required every 10 years be placed on a reserve component list and reserve funds used for that study? Excellent to... question. Asked a more of a legal nature, and I think that we will deal with that after we get into the first cycle of the reports, and then we're moving forward with it. But it's an, a good question, and it's entirely possible you could use the reserve funds to a point for uh, compliance purposes, so long as it's already accounted for. If you're going to use the funds, though, for a different purpose than what it's accounted for, then it takes a vote of the membership in order to be able to do that. Okay. And hey, Jeff, if, if I can interrupt for a second, mm -hmm. uh, one of the important things on the tax side that's going to come into, into vogue here is the fact that uh, for this funding that we're talking about, whether it be reserve funding or a special assessment to fund for this, to the extent it's for future capital expenditure, it ameliorates it a little bit on the owner's part to know that it's a capital contribution for them and it goes to increase the basis of their property so that when they go to sell, their basis in their property has increased. What so is the putting the money into the reserve? By, by fund, the money that's being funded to the reserve doesn't go through your operating. It basically is considered a capital contribution by the owner which goes to increase their basis in the property. Now there's three exceptions because you know tax always has an exception just like the attorneys do. Um, and that's reserve funding that is uh, with respect to contingencies, deferred maintenance and painting. So any other project that is going and painting because of the fact that the IRS considers painting um, as a maintenance item and not a capital expenditure. So that when these are voted on, these reserves are voted on or these special assessments are collected. The second thing to do is to put those funds in a special bank account, not commingle it with your operating funds, because that establishes to the IRS in the unlikely event that you're audited that those funds, in effect, were earmarked for capital expenditures. So uh, go through that one more time. What items add to the basis, if you will, for the owner, add to the any, basis? Any, exp any reserve funding that's uh, associated with a future capital expenditure. So what are we talking about? Concrete, roofing, um, you know, the, the, the windows, uh, you know, paving, paving, anything that's generally speaking that's in a condominium right now in their straight line reserve. I'm going to play the role that. of the owner bill. Well, I got my bill from the association and I have to pay my thousand dollars a month for regular assessments and to meet the new reserve requirements for this year because we were late and didn't have it in the budget, et cetera, a special assessment. But everything is commingled in the special assessment or everything is commingled into the budget. So how is the owner to break that out later to get the benefit of the step up in the basis? Well, that's what should be broken out at the time that you're doing the funding for that so that th those components between the operating and the capital are broken out. Um, in terms of reporting. Bill, I will never comment on taxes except to say, call your tax accountant. I would love for <laughs> yeah, you- Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're not giving any type of tax advice here today. I would love for you to put something together on that. And I will um, obviously, you know, give you credit as the author, but I would like to put something out in the roundup about the need of the association to take this into account every year. So it has the information, like almost on a spreadsheet, that it can that the board can give to the owners so that from let's see 2024 2025 and onward there's a number that they can have you know that the owners have 
so that when they do sell their unit one day, they get the benefit of the step up. Right. Okay. Typically, what people can see right now as on their, their financials is they're going to see on the uh, reserve uh, the um, the funding for the revenue that comes in in the operating column. And then to the right of that, you've got your funds. Well, your funds generally are thought to be the funds that are expended, except for these three categories that I gave an exception about are capital. And so those would be considered at the top of the envelope as a capital contribution when you're going to look at them. And, and putting this into the real world, I mean, it's most important for someone maybe who doesn't have homestead protection, but someone who's going to have to then pay a gain on the difference between what they purchased the unit for, what they sold it for. And now they have a $200,000 or $300,000 gain, which then could be offset by these figures you're describing, but they have to be kept track of and you need to prove it to the IRS if they ever ask. Correct. So, yeah, that's something to really, no one is really focused on that yet. So thank you for bringing that up. Good stuff. Yeah. Rudy, this one looks like it might be for you. Are, there, are the certified structural engineers also going to certify the condition of the electrical and plumbing aspects of the inspection? So in the milestone inspection, we're looking at the structural integrity. We're not getting into the MEP, the mechanical electrical plumbing. In the SERS report, we are going to be reviewing and putting a line item for replacement, repair of the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. So in the milestone, no, we won't be doing the MEP, but in the structural integrity reserve, yes, there are line items for MEP. Okay. And we have another one uh, back to back. So hold off on that cup of water here. Is it prudent to hire an engineer for an informal, informal review first before doing the phase one milestone? Look, we're gonna come out and we're gonna look at the building and we're going to walk the building with you and we're going to give you, I guess you can call it free advice during our, our walkthrough before we send the proposal. We're not trying to fire these proposals and off you know, without looking at the, the property. Um, some of them we can, but um, yes, let's have a conversation before, um, but I don't think you need to hire somebody. You don't, you're not gonna hire a maid to clean your house before the maid comes and cleans your house. So. When you're ready to hire them, it's going to be a one-time shot, but get us out to the property. Let us walk. Let's talk about options um, for us or any engineer that you go with. So no, I don't think it uh, makes sense to hire somebody twice to do a preliminary um, review. And, well, and my I wife would beg to differ because we end up getting the house ready for the housekeeping crew before they come over. So I, you know, I don't know about that. <laughs> you're, 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 not the only <laughs> you're actually not the only one. So that was probably a bad, uh, that was probably a bad analogy. <laughs> I need to shift that analogy to something else. Yeah. But if I can chime in, you know, one of the questions uh, before Jeff was, you know, what do we need to do in 2023? So, you know, there's a lot of timing issues from a management side, basically getting everybody around the table together you know, and having Rudy's team come out and do that first inspection, you know, milestone, even if it's just to get to know you kind of meeting first, but then they actually do the inspection, get the report writing. It's not something that's the report, and Rudy, correct me if I'm wrong, it's not done overnight. Um, you know, it's, it's going to take several weeks and pictures and everything else to get done. So as we all think, 2023 is a very long period of time, but it's going to take, uh, and you want to get it done before your budget. We typically do start our budgets in that kind of, uh, you know, August, September timeframe. So you really only have about six months of kind of planning to get there to sit around the table and, and start really putting it into your budget for your, your budget cycle. So that's where I would kind of going back to that original, original question, starting now, start figuring out, you know, get Rudy out there, take a look at the property uh, and, and properties are all in varying states. What do we need to do so that we can properly plan for what 2023 looks like starting in January? Okay. Yeah, get started now. Um, yeah. ASAP. Um, there's this is when this legislation is passed, they usually don't think about the bandwidth of the industry around it. Um, and that's not why they pass laws. They want the industry around it to catch up. So get started now. The structural integrity reserve, it could take up to a month to six weeks. The milestone inspection could take just as long. And then if we have to get into a phase two with the milestone inspection, uh, then it could be even longer. Um, so I would get started as soon as possible. That's a great comment. Okay. 
You know, there's a question here that almost anybody here can answer, but I think from a management company perspective, Brian, maybe you take this one first. Is it worth shopping around for another reserve company? And the meaning there is we have used the same one for the last uh, couple on site, for the last couple of on site reserve inspections. Do you think there would be a difference in what is estimated for each of our line items? So I, I guess it's like another way of are they all going to be similar you know what you know like what, what do you think in your experience as, yeah, uh, as so a management company? if you've been comfortable with your current provider and, you, and you're getting them updated frequently you know obviously you're if you just got it done this year it probably was a drastic increase with uh you know supply chain issues cost of um the raw materials and things of that nature so they probably increased dramatically from you know a couple of years ago um Again, if you're running into, you're comfortable, they come out, they're not just, you know, uh, kind of submitting a brand new report and it's, and it's easy for them and you form a partnership. We're big on, on the overall partnerships, which I think speaks volumes to what, you know, this kind of roundtable discussion even is about because we have great partnerships with your attorneys, with your engineers, with your bankers, with your CPAs, because that's what you're going to have all your experts come together. So I would say if you're comfortable with your reserve advisor and the numbers have been accurate most likely you, you are trying to make some of those repairs and the numbers have been fairly close they're going to be conservative then i would say you're fine if you've been with that person for a very long period of time i mean they should be close but maybe a, you know i don't want to say it's time to make a change but you would have to really judge and compare what's been in that report if you've reserved has it been accurate you know if it's been a, a roof replacement and they only had a million dollars and it cost three million it might be time to change if it's a million fifty Okay, then maybe it's not time to change. That's just some, you know, some maybe some inflationary numbers. Um, also, keep in mind that the visual inspection has to be done by a licensed engineer. So the right. reserve study company can compile the reserve study and present it to you. If they don't have a licensed engineer on staff, they will have to use a licensed engineer this time to do the the study. Correct. I want to go back a little bit to the uh, question I phrased before regarding if you completed your structural integrity reserve study by December 31st, 2024, um, but you've already voted on your 2025 budget in October of that same year, do you then have to amend the 2025 budget? And um, apparently the division of condominium has taken the position that so long as you voted on your budget in 2024, for 2025, before you got the report, then your first year of applying those new reserves in the Sears would be 2026. Now, this information came to us verbally during a seminar that a few of us were at. By the way, nine or 10 of us at uh, K. Bender Rembaum are board certified experts. We uh, all go to a conference once a year. It's two days. We're community association lawyers. We all get together and uh, discuss all sorts of interesting subjects. So this information came from the division, but it came verbally, it did not come in writing. So please bear that in mind and you will need to check with your association lawyer should you have that particular issue. Excellent info there. And what, okay, here's one. What if our, con this is, I think this has come up a couple of different times in the chain here. So we'll just answer it for, for everybody who's alluded to this. What if our condo has two story and three story buildings in the phases? Does the law apply? And that would just be for the ones that are three stories or higher, correct? That's, okay. that's the way I would look at it. Yeah. All right. Uh, timeshare organizations, are they required to adhere to this new law? Uh, if, it is somehow a condominium. If it's a uh, condominium timeshare, then yes. Jeff, what about these condo hotels? Ritz Carlton's doing a big push for these condo hotels. Where do you sure. draw the line there? That's a great question. Where do you draw the line? I've got some buildings where the second, third, and fourth floor are not part of the condominium. It's actually part of the master association where the recreational facilities are for other associations on the in, in the same land area, you know, big tall towers, if you will. And certain components are simply not part of the condominium. What applies and what doesn't? We need further clarification from the division. But I would take the, I would um, basically use the legal description of the condominium itself. And then the lawyer is gonna have to sit down with the architect or engineer that's performing the studies before they begin so that everybody's on the same page as to what portions of the building apply and don't apply. 
You're going to have to take it on a case by case. This might be a Rudy question, might also be quasi legal. Elevators are not specifically included in Sears. Will they be included as a safety item? It's, uh, a cost of greater than $10,000 is going to be included. It's in the catch all. Correct. And same thing with seawalls. I've asked that. That question has come up a few, especially along the water. The seawall is part of your foundational item, if you will, uh, hold, hold the building together. So yep. that'll also be included. Okay, now this S SB for this bill. Okay, this is, this also has come up a few times. So we'll just as we see him. This is the entire state, correct, everybody? This is not just like it was in the past, Broward, Miami Dade. The question specifically here: Does it also apply to the Florida Keys and Monroe County? And the answer is absolutely yes. Jeff, we're going to give you an honorary law degree for that one. I, I'm <laughs> not a lawyer, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn at some point in my life. There's my bad dad joke of the day. You're very welcome. Uh, you have to explain that one to me later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I guess it, it was that bad. Uh, our management. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Hey, Jeff, I just want to interrupt one second. Yep. Uh, when, you, when you were talking just now about the master associations, the master associations are usually uh, owned by the owners in the con underlying condominium areas, correct? So yeah. wouldn't that then attach by, by law then that uh, they would be subject to it as well? Maybe. What if it's what if for some reason the master isn't a condominium association and is kept out of the 718 regime for one technical reason or another? Then it gets really interesting. Okay. Management company question. It looks like our management company says they have done the re report required by 2023. However, they say they can't print a copy. Is that true? So I guess they're asking, is it something that's public? And it, should Hold it be on, shared with all of the owners? Let's go backwards a step. What report is due by 2023 other than providing that basic information to the division of condominiums? Just what they have, right? Just what they have to report. And that's a matter of public record. If anybody wanted that, they could write a, do a public record request to the division of condominium. But all it's not going to have very much information in it, right? How many buildings, how many stories are they? And where's it located? It's not- let's, ex you know. let's, let's expand upon that question then. Let's assume the person meant any, any of the findings that come in from the any, any of the reserve studies or any of the engineering companies that come in, is all of that uh, supposed to be open to all unit owners to yes. inspect? Yes. Okay. So that's maybe what she meant. Uh, please provide. I only got a number. Blah, blah, blah. Do you think, okay, this is more of a, have you heard any, I'm going to reword this question. Have any of you heard any ramblings about Hurricane Ian damage potentially affecting any of these deadlines? Have you heard anything in the pipeline up to this point? Nothing, but okay. I don't think we would either. Don't forget this year, legislative session uh, in the off year is going to be March, I think. Legislative session begins. It'll be March, April, and into May when it ends. So there's a long time between now and then. Hard okay. to say. That's coming up quite a bit here, too. Uh, so I forgive think me. That the knee jerk reaction would not be to provide relief because of Ian. If anything, it indicates more of a need to be in compliance in case of another Ian. Okay. This one might be a Brian and Jeff question here. What is the best way for an individual member of the board of directors to protect, to protect him or herself from the overall board failing to comply with SB with the rules besides resigning from the board? I can answer that one pretty quick. Brian, you want to go? <laughs> so like I, first. Also in, in quotes, resigning from the board, but um, I mean, <laughs> It's, yeah, I mean, they have to comply. I mean, it's very, very simple. So, I mean, there is no other way around it. And if they don't, I would say, and again, I'm, I'm no attorney, but uh, I mean, it would, it would have to go up against your DNO policy and, and, you know, they should be, they're protected and they need to do it. Well, the, really though, the board member is concerned here that he knows it's supposed to be done or she, but the board isn't doing it. So That's what is that board member then to do? It's negligence. Yeah, they would have to, you know, so... Again, I think they'd have to work with the attorney and, and start filing things with the state and, and making it happen. So if the board is adamant of going against it and just hypothetically not um, following the, you know, and they're just going to miss the deadlines that we've discussed throughout the day, then uh, I mean, that's the only way is you'd have to file with the state and, and really, you know, kind of go after them with some, with some legal letters and work. 
And a couple other suggestions as well. If the board majority fails to take steps to comply with the new legislation and you're in the minority, you do have a fiduciary duty to the company. So in addition to alerting the division of condominium, which is certainly something you can do, um, you, you want to protect your individual self in writing. You want to send an email to the entire board um, regarding the obligations and the fact that you advocated for them and that they defeated your advocation to move forward to comply. You, you want to set the stage so that it shows you're doing everything you can to comply. You want to involve the manager at that point. I would think you would want to involve the lawyer at that point, um, et, et cetera. And there is breach of fiduciary duty claims that can be brought for those that do not comply with the new legislation. Let's hope that yourself in the meeting minutes. You know, if, if meetings are happening and things are coming up to make a, a request document, 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 basically. Right. And you could also, you know, you are there as a board member. You're a liaison from the membership, if you will, to the company. You can also inform the membership of the issue at that point as well, should it be jeopardizing the association standing. Uh, one of the questions we get as well is what if we had to comply with Miami Dade, Boca, or Broward counties? Uh, local ordinances for various reports regarding our building. Do we still have to comply with the state requirements and vice versa? For the time being, these items are mutually exclusive of one another. So bear that in mind as you're doing your target dates. But obviously, if you just had one report uh, prepared to comply with the state and then your local government is requiring a similar report, you would go back to that same vendor. And I can't imagine they would charge you the same you know, price, if you will, for generating that second report to be in compliance. Okay. So here's one. We get that a lot. So we get, we get that yeah. a lot. And the 40 year inspection is very similar to the milestone. So people in South Florida, Southeast Florida, they've already been through this, but people in the rest of the part of the state, there are engineers that have experience doing this milestone inspection. And if you got a letter from your local municipality for your 40 year, that has to be filed and sent but you also have to do the milestone that has to be filed differently and also sent. So you will have to do both. Okay. Is the 30 year inspection retroactive or is it only for properties reaching 30 years of 30 years of age? Yes to both. I uh, want to answer that one. I'm not sure what the individual is asking when the, when it's been 30 years from the date of the initial CO, that's your target, unless you're within three miles of the coastline and then it's 25 years. Okay, and Charles, if that's you, Charles, I know you. You have my cell number. If if I if I if if you want to clarify, text me, and I'll then I'll bring it back up. <laughs> uh, I haven't heard from Barry today. If you're out there, thank you for listening. Not yet, and, and panelists too. If you see a question, uh, there's so many on here. If you see one that you that you're itching to answer, raise your hand, and I'll uh, and uh, just go ahead and answer it, and I'll I'll call on you there. Uh, let's see here. What does st structural integrity reserve study include? Items that are not why does structural integrity reserve study include items that are not life safety related because that's the way the legislation is drafted and there's the catch-all in little g for those components where the uh, expense is greater than ten thousand dollars maybe that number should be adjusted it's been ten thousand dollars i think since i started practicing and i'm not going to go back into that decade <laughs> Is it safe for us to contract to get our milestone and Sears done soon, or is it possible glitch laws will change the required elements, required deadlines, or do away with some of them or all of them totally? I guess it's more of a gut we question. That future, but you need to have your reports done within the time frame that the legislature says you must have them done. You need to be applying them within the years that the legislation requires compliance. You see, you know what I'm noticing too is that a lot of these questions, I, I think everybody's hearing attorneys and professionals in the, in the industry saying that this was done so darn quickly that many anticipate some kinds of changes coming on down the road. Obviously, we can't predict those, but I think so many folks here have heard so many people say that, which is why we're getting so many questions like that. Uh, Rudy, you have uh, something you'd like to uh, take care of? I do. We get this one quite a bit. Yeah. So there doesn't seem to be a standard or uniform protocol for visual structural portions of the milestone in SIRS. Different engineers, architects may apply different subjective standards. 
can the board disregard an inspection that they don't like, then pay for another second opinion. So when an engineer inspects your building, it is going to be left up to his interpretation based on his experience, his education, so on and so forth. So that is not going to be the exact same inspection from one engineer to the other. But once we inspect your building and we give you a repair specification and suggestions, that will be filed. And if, the, and if we say that you have to fix A, B, C, and D, that the state is gonna require you to fix A, B, C, and D, even if you get another engineer and he files a different report and it says, we think you should only fix A and B, they're gonna make sure that you're gonna to have to fix A, B, C, and D. So let's talk about that in the real world in the context of Champlain disaster, where the board of directors received their initial engineering report. If you haven't read it, you ought to. It's available, you can just Google it and you'll find it. Um, in the very last page, second to last paragraph or so, was a stern warning from the engineer saying this, these dangers are imminent and you need to act. And the board did. And they started to do the levy of the special. And then the election came up and they all got voted out and a new board got voted in. Time goes by, a few months, what have you, they invite the local town engineer, the town inspector, somebody from the building department to come to the building and do a walkthrough who said, yeah, it looks pretty good. And that board decided to do nothing based on that verbal. Then the building falls down a year and a half later. So if you have one engineer that says you gotta, and then you opinion shop it to find another engineer that doesn't say you gotta, I think you're playing with fire in a very dangerous way. You yeah, that's come up. You want to comment on that? Yeah, that's come up a lot for us. You know, how do you, I've heard, how do you trust the engineer that it's, you know, do we need to shop around? I said, well, well first, you're, we have a finite number of engineers that, and architects that can actually go out and do this and get this done. And, you know, you, do you really want to play with fire in that regard? Like there's things that, I mean, some of our buildings, they've deferred maintenance, they've kicked the can similar to a, a Champlain, they just kind of kept kicking it down the road and things just get worse and worse. And they don't really understand that it is a, you know, certain things are wearable items, like in a car, like you got to change the oil, you got to change the tires, you got to, they just kind of keep going. So we've been asked a lot, you know, well, what if they say we have to do A, B, and C? You're a really great example. Um, but then we go get another uh, engineer, we do this. I said, well, the intent of the law is to protect your association and protect the building. Will things change? And they all think that, well, it's all just going to go away. It's, it's not because not of the disaster. Yes, things may get clarified as they do, but the intent is to protect the building uh, and, and really kind of get it back to where it needs to be because they know that a lot of the boards and membership have waived reserved, waived funding, waived all these different things and really pushed, uh, you know, deferred maintenance uh, out there because they didn't want to, they didn't want to pay for it. And so they want to, they want to get reelected you know, in, in for short-term uh, solutions. So we've worked with a lot of our boards on the understanding and the the intent, because certain things had some, you know, like how do you reserve for a foundation item, you know, like the foundation of a building, you're not replacing it, but there are some repair things. And so that, that's where they thought, well, if the foundation gets wiped out, well, maybe other things will and, and it won't. So, but it's a, some interesting conversation sometimes. Well, uh... Charles did send me a text and he clarified, since our building is 40 years old, are we required to conduct a 30 year milestone inspection? So that's what he was clarifying his question from earlier. If he received a letter from his local municipality about a 30 year inspection, he's got to satisfy that letter. If he has not received one, then he does not. Well, I don't know, because even if the, le the legislation still says you have to do it within... 30 years, right? Within 30 years of your initial CO, every 10 years thereafter. And there's also a separate requirement to complete the report within 180 days from the notice uh, from local government. But those two items are actually independent of one another. So if you prepared your report and got it done prior to receiving the demand from local government to get it done, you might need a second stamp from the same engineer to be in compliance because that's yes, another glitch right. in the legislation. Yes, let me let me clarify. If you receive a four, if a forty year milestone inspection, you've got to set from Broward County. You have to satisfy that, and then if you get a milestone, you have to satisfy that. So we will have to produce produce two reports. One will have a template from the county. Unfortunately, the milestone inspection from the state does not have a template, so we have to formulate our own. 
Um, Jeffrey, I'm surprised you haven't hit me with the question that I think you really like asking because you like to see engineers squirm, which is um, how do you do a structural integrity reserve for a foundation? Do you remember that question from last time? I don't. Okay, so that was one of the questions that was asked. Okay. And obviously, we can't do a replacement cost for a foundation. That means you'd have to tear down the building and build a new one. So what we're going to do there in that line item is we're going to do um, either a repair cost to repair it or to maintain it. So it's a deferred maintenance option instead of a complete replacement. Obviously, a complete replacement of the foundation would be astronomical. You have to rebuild a new building. So when we clarified um, with people that we feel that were the right people to clarify this with, it is maintaining and repairing the foundation or the structural wall, because obviously we're not going to be replacing those items. If we do have to replace those items, we might deem it unsafe to be habitable. Sure. Yeah, if you need to replace the foundation I would, or structural elements, I would think uh, no one should be living there. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yes, no doubt. Um, you know what, uh, Jeff, real quick, one, one of the questions, because yeah. um, I'm, I'm reading through a few, and we'll get this question a lot, especially as we start building the budgets, and maybe it's for, for Bill as well from, you, I loved your example on what's fully funded, you know, the $100,000 item, you, pull, help, you use it for six years, you know, you should have 60. Well, a lot of our associations have waived those reserves tremendously. And the term fully funded has always confused. Does that mean we have to play catch up now? You know, right. what if we only reserved 10,000? Under the new not? requirements, uh, the short answer is yes. There's no ability to waive or reduce. So if now that component, which you waived in the past, the roof, and you've waived it year after year, and now you need to account for it in full based on the new requirements on Senate Bill 4D, no waiving or reducing, and you're in year nine, well, then your reserve calculation is going to have to include 90% of the value. That's, that's correct, Jeff. I agree with you. Yep. You know what? I would love the legislature. I'm really a believer of... Uh, People have the right to control their destiny to a point. So if people want to be, and forgive me for saying it this way, uh, naive enough, I guess, to vote to waive or reduce, that's a choice the community makes. But maybe they should put that back in the legislation with a heightened standard. So maybe it's not a majority of a quorum, maybe it's a majority of all, maybe it's 75% of all, but with the added requirement that a report be published that shows the replacement cost and the shortfall. And that little report is another report that has to be published on the association website and given to prospective purchasers, the whole gamut. But and, you know, maybe that will happen in time. There's no discussion about that right now, but I don't think it's unreasonable to give the owners the choice to decide how and when they want to save. I'm a single family homeowner. I know I'm gonna need a new roof. My roof has a 30 year life. I'm in year 16. Do I put a couple dollars away every year or do I wait until year 30 when I have to replace it? That's my choice. Why shouldn't condominium owners also have some discretion in terms of how much they want to save or not, so long as everybody's on, it's a fair playing field. So purchasers are aware of the issue, owners are aware of the issue, and it's not a shock all of a sudden when there is a big bill that comes in an assessment due for replacement or repair. Yeah, but Jeff, in, in the financials right now, in the footnote, if you're not fully funding, there's a disclosure there that basically says that going forward, you could have a special assessment. Well, that's there, but it doesn't really, address, and you're correct, how many people actually read that report other than uh, you and me and the manager and the board members? <laughs> Um, some owners do. I won't say that they don't, but the majority don't. But it doesn't go into that footnote does not go into near enough specificity as to the financial obligations that will begin to occur when the component needs repair replacement. Jamie, I have a question for you. So there can be a special assessment to satisfy that reserve, especially if, like Brian said, they kicked the can down the road. And now that to fill that reserve, it's substantial. And they can do a special assessment. Have been, have, can you get a loan to satisfy a, a, a reserve? So the way that the law is written today, it requires the cash to be in the bank. So it would, some associations have contacted us and asked if they could take out a line of credit 
to satisfy the requirement? And the answer today is no. That would give them accessibility to the funds, but the law today states the funds need to be in the bank account. So can There's they only... borrow a 10 year, take a 10 year loan? Well, but that- A loan, not a line of credit, but an actual loan with a money- Understood, but the line of, but that loan is year over year your reserve requirements are annual and there's only two ways to repay the loan, special assessment or budget. So we've looked at that. The, if the glitch bill allowed accessibility to a line of credit, yes, we would write a line of credit, but it doesn't allow that today. Interesting. So that could be something that Jeff could work on. Might do that. So a line of credit to account for the reserve shortfall. Shortfall. Right. And we would allow, we would be okay to write that if the bill didn't today require physically having the cash in the bank. Okay, Jamie, here's your homework. I'll write it. Will mm -hmm. truists, lobbyists push it? And that's a question I know you cannot answer today or publicly. But if you can get to the right people within your company and have that discussion, will they push it at a legislative level? Then our firm can push it. Um, possibly some other organizations that I have some uh, work that I do some work with as well. And, and maybe we can get some traction on that. It's not a bad thought. And that goes with the idea that we don't believe that I mean, we're theoretically going to bankrupt a lot of associations, taking them from zero to 100% funding. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there has to be some type of staggered, realistic expectation of an association. And that would also fall into that, you know, being substantiated with that line of credit. I it would agree. help then, those that are not going to be bankrupt or looking for developers to sell out their buildings. Hey, Jamie, what did you do before you started working for Truist? I just want everybody to understand the depth that you bring. You're not just a association commercial loan officer at Truist. You have a tremendous background with association matters. What was that background? I was a property manager for 30 years. I have a PCAM designation through CAI. I keep my credentials up every year. So Jamie really knows her stuff, everybody. A PCAM is the highest designation a licensed community association manager can get. It's very difficult. It takes a long time and a lot of study and a lot of effort. This is just kind of a, our treasurer is an accountant. Can he do a, can he do a reserve study? <laughs> no. I just wanted, I just wanted to read that one out loud. Um, let's see here. Well, Ag, you can't do the study. They're going to need the engineer or architect to opine and to provide certain data. I suppose if they had all the data in place, could then the... Uh, put the report together anyway. Yeah, put the actual report together and run the calculations, I think just about any of us could do if you yeah. had the data. Uh, Jamie, a question about services. Do, does Truist make loans available for cooperatives? Somebody wants yeah. to know. Yes. Ooh, condominiums. Do. That's good. Condominiums, homeowners association, and cooperatives. We treat them all the same. The collateral for the loan is the accounts receivable billing rights. Let's see here. Forgive me as I'm going through. We have so many questions here. I have one, Jeffrey. Is a self-managed association, is the board liable for the reserve study and milestone? 100% yes. It's any condo building doesn't take a lawyer to answer that one folks <laughs> <laughs> exhibit a let's see here that's uh does m2e work in brevard county yes we do we're in miami west palm orlando and tampa and we're covering the whole state right now wow so we're covering the whole state as well we are in miami dade broward palm beach hillsborough and orange and cover the state of Florida. So we can share that in common, Rudy. Um, let's go to Castle real quick. Where is your areas, if you will, Brian? Oh, of course, so we have our main uh, hub in plantation, uh, so Broward County. Uh, we have West Palm Beach, Orlando, Jacksonville, Tampa, Sarasota, and then Southwest Florida in our Fort Myers office. But we basically cover the entire state throughout those individual offices. And Bill, I know I've referred all sorts of clients to you from all over the state over the years. 
Hafer and Company is just a uh, really well in tuned with Florida Association financial accounting and responsibilities. But what is your target areas? Our target area is a whole state, actually. Uh, we've got satellite offices down in Miami, in Naples, in Orlando, um, and you know our main office is here in Palm Beach County. Nice. And Jamie, I know you're the whole state of Florida. Correct. We're the whole state of Florida. I'm the manager over the relationship managers throughout the state, and we are in 16 additional states. Wow. And we'll do a couple more. Everybody okay with a couple more questions before uh, uh, breaking for lunch for everybody? Sure. Okay. As this long as person... everyone's staying with us, and I think they are. So thank you, everybody out there that's been listening to us. We do truly appreciate you spending your time with us today. Uh, confused a little about reserve changes in the new law. Our association has a July 1st fiscal year. We budget at 100% reserves and then have a community vote to waive 100% and go to 3.5. Can we continue to budget this way or does this new law eliminate our ability to change the reserve? You're not going to be doing it that way anymore because once this goes into effect, you can no longer waive or reduce. Mm -hmm. Doesn't get any more clear than that. <laughs> okay, here then. Hollywood, can I M2E? Okay, well, everybody, I have a lot of people asking for information. Everybody here today is going to get a follow up email uh, tomorrow around this time. We'll have everybody's contact information. This recording will also be available on kbrlegal.com. And once it's uh, available, we will share it with all of our partners here today, with all of our presenters here today as well to uh, use as they as they choose. Which really is the reason uh, that we're doing today. So I do want to thank all the attendees and the panelists for coming. We had all done this webinar a month or so ago. And due to a glitch, needing a glitch bill, I suppose, the recording button <laughs> didn't get pressed. And we had so many requests for, hey, how can I watch this? I want my board to watch this. So uh, we'll be putting out an email, I know, from K. Ben Derembaum, and I hope all the panelists will as well, that we're advertising for attendees as to how folks that didn't join us today can still watch this, and we will have it up and posted. So you'll be able to uh, watch it again. Whatever. commercial condominiums are commercial are commercial condominiums also uh that has a 90 condominium or cooperative there was no real clarification or distinction between commercial versus residential in at least in purposes of today's conversation okay and two stories no if our reserve study if our reserve study was done in 2022 and encompasses all of the categories of the new law, can that be adopted as our Sears? I would want, 2022 is a little early. It's an interesting question. If it does, it, if it complies, it complies, but I still think you should run it by in the requisite year in which you're going to be adopting it for com compliance purposes. Um, by the engineer or architect and have them do a refresher on it so it's more timely would be a, a uh, prudence if you will right good good business good good business judgment being exercised if you were to do that would you be required to do that i'm going to direct you to your association's lawyer to have that conversation because different lawyers may feel differently about that okay well we had so many darn questions we didn't get to all of them but we want to thank you all for appearing here. Before we uh, take off for today, I want to go around the room one more time. Everybody that was here today is going, we will send all of the uh, answered and unanswered questions to all of our uh, panel today. So everybody will receive them. If you are asking for contact, you will get that contact. Uh, so everybody will get this report. But before we uh, take off for today, I want to go around the room one more time. I want to thank everybody for being here. We'll start with Bill. Bill, please uh, tell us one more time how everybody can reach you and if you have any closing comments for today. Yeah, Bill Kogallon with Hafer CPAs. Uh, I'm going to put down in the chat room our, our contact information and certainly you can reach out and give an email. I'm glad everyone attended. I mean, I know that there's going to be a lot of questions that are going to be continuing as people get into uh, these reserve studies and the like. And so I ask that everybody take uh, note of everyone that's been on the panel here and as these questions come up, please reach out to us. And thanks for a great class. Thank you so much, Bill. Brian, let's go to you. Brian from, from Castle Group. Uh, how can people reach you and any closing words you might have? 
Yeah, uh, excellent. Uh, thank you guys very much. I mean, uh, amazing attendance. I'll, I'll put my information in the chat. Um, you know, my final thoughts would be, you know, a kind of failure to plan is planning to fail mentality. Start right. the process now. You have to get to know the engineers, get your attorneys around the table, um, you know, do this early. Um, and that's how, you know, you'll, you'll be successful in this. Yes, things may change, but just being putting your partners around the table so everybody's on the same page, you have a plan moving forward and, uh, and, and you'll be successful. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Brian. And I'm going to move over now to Jamie from Truist. Jamie, uh, how can people reach you and any closing comments, please? I hope everyone enjoyed the class, found it very informative. My information is in the chat. My phone number is 561-251-1980. And just keep in the back of your mind that interest rates are rising. So contacting whoever your financial institution is to determine some type of loan to get you started is a good opportunity. Thank you, Jamie. It was great to see you. And Rudy, M2E Consulting Engineers, uh, yes. any final words? How can people reach you? Yes, I put my email and our uh, general email in the chat. I will send a follow-up email and you guys will provide my contact information. We're here to help. We know it's a daunting task. We empathize with everybody going through this, but we are here to help. Education is key. We can set up education for individual property managers or board members. We are, we're truly here to help. Thank you. Thank you, Rudy. Jeff, I know how to reach you. How can everybody else reach you? <laughs> no final words, really, other than thanking everybody for your wonderful attendance today and these great questions. I'm very accessible. You can reach me at uh, jrembaum at kbrlegal.com, 561-241-4462, or a little secret, any of our phone numbers all ring to the same switchboard. It really doesn't matter. <laughs> so pick a phone number and you'll be able to reach me. The secret is out. Well, thank you all. I know how busy you all are, especially in today's times. Thank you for being here. Thank you.